Yeah. Uh, my name is Joe Heth, as I mentioned already, and we'll be talking about mutation testing. So can I see maybe a show of hands? Has anybody heard of or ever done mutation testing before? Heard. Heard of? Heard. Done, tried. Good, all right, cool. All right, so I learned about mutation testing probably about eight or nine years ago, but it was in an academic setting. Uh, I think I have yet to see it in a professional setting. Um, I found it very interesting uh, from just a kind of a research or theory approach to testing. Um, so we'll, we'll show you what it's all about. Um, so first of all, I think in our community, in, Ru in the Ruby world, right, testing is good. Testing has largely been adopted probably by every language nowadays. So uh, there's great reasons to do it, right, to avoid regressions, to ensure some level of code quality, and to just demonstrate expected behavior. If you want to know what a piece of code is doing as a new developer, uh, you should be able to go in and uh, read some specs, look at the inputs, look at the outputs, and, and get some kind of reasonable uh, understanding of what that code is doing. Um, along with code, uh, with testing, uh, we often look at a metric called code coverage, right? Um, so we, we shoot for some number, 80%, 90%, the holy grail of 100 that I don't think uh, anybody or hardly any production level system maybe reaches, I'm not sure. Um, but, but is that a good metric? Is, is code coverage meaningful? So does it, does it tell you how good your tests are? Um, or is it a bunch of smoke tests that call every method but have zero assertions, right? You don't really know um, what that code is doing. So what mutation testing is and what it's, uh, why it even exists is it, it's, it's designed to expose weaknesses in your test suite. Um, so often we are writing tests to expose weaknesses in our code, uh, but who is watching our tests, right? Maybe our tests aren't that great. Um, so they, uh, in mutation testing, they kind of have this phrase of who watches the watchman. So your mutation testing approach is watching your tests that's watching your code. Um, so the idea behind mutation testing is that it's going to take your existing test suite and run that against your code. And then it's going to start modifying your underlying code in all kinds of crazy fun ways and rerunning your test suite over and over again to see what m modifications to your code are actually caught and which ones are not. Um, so think about that, I guess, in your daily code. Could you go into a piece of code and a method and change an operator or remove a line of code and run your test suite? And would your test suite still pass? I'm guessing for a lot of people, it probably would. So, <laughs> um, so there's a Wikipedia page, obviously, with more information, more about the background, the research, the theory. Uh, again, I feel like it's largely <coughs> comes out of kind of an academic type setting. Um, there is a mutation uh, kind of testing library or uh, tool in, in pretty much every language. Uh, we will be looking at the one for Ruby tonight, obviously. Um, so let's, uh, oh yeah, so next step here in mutation. So uh, what are the types of mutations that can be done to your code? And you guys can probably think of them yourselves. Um, mutation testing can be done manually. You can go in and change your code and run your tests. Um, but we like to automate things. So um, that's largely what this is about. Um, but so, yeah, I'll let you guys look at the list here. But uh, think of ways that things would mutate. Um, some of them you may not think about of what, what if you go start changing your math operators around? Um, or what if you start changing your Boolean logic? Um, what if you remove entire lines of code? You know, what, what would actually happen there? Um, another fun one is replacing variables. If you have a number of variables all in your, the same scope that are of the same type, what if you start mixing and matching those variables? Um, so the idea behind mutation testing is that it's still going to produce a runnable copy of code. It's not going to seg folder. It's not going to, you know, cause problems. Well, it might with a nil, nil error, but um, you're going to get a, a runnable copy of your code that your test would be able to to run over. Um, so, um, what is the goal of mutation testing? And it's to kill the mutants. So each mutated version of your code is called a mutant. Um, and your tests are run over that mutant code uh, to see, again, if it will find and to detect and reject that mutant or if it lets it, lets it through. Um, so at the end, after running your suite, you're left with a mutation score. So the number of mutants that you killed 
over the, over the total number of mutants that were generated, um, and you get some value out of 100%. So the goal is to have 100% uh, 100 score. Um, one caveat here is, uh, is a thing in mutation testing called equivalent mutants. So what happens if, the, uh, if you modify your code um, and it, it behaves functionally the same, functionally identical? You can make that change and there would be no difference. Um, and I'll show you an example of that here in a bit. Uh, this is what would be known as kind of some false positives, right? It mutated it, maybe your spec fails to capture it, but it's not really a failure because the code is still behaving the exact same way. Um, so that's um, one thing that, that happens or can happen during kind of a mutation testing run. Um, so uh, let's jump into an example, a live example. We're going to try to do a group programming assignment here where we try to kill all the mutants. Um, so we are going to be using this mutant <coughs> gem. Um, there was a, a gem many years ago called Heckle, I think, um, that is really no longer, I guess, worth talking about. But um, Mutant is uh, very actively developed and, uh, yeah, it re really has a great set of functionality and features for um, for running every code. It supports pure Ruby um, as well as Rails applications, just with a different kind of setup or bootstrap to it. Um, so we are going to run it against a, a, an open source library that I have been working with a little bit at Tinderbox. Zoho is a, uh, a, a CRM um, that we were thinking about integrating with, but I decided to take this, um, this, this library and run Mutant through it. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, hopefully you guys can see this. Uh, I thought I had it big enough. Is that maybe big enough for you guys to see? Right. Transparent. What's that? Non-transparency. Non-transparency? Maybe. <laughs> do you know how to do that? <laughs> Is there any preferences? Can you just put a black page behind it? <laughs> <laughs> what if you just right click the terminal on this? Right click this thing? No, no, like this. Like Say it again, Clayton. Like right click inside of the terminal. Oh, in here? Nope. All right. If we, uh, I don't think I have a good black screen here, so I'm just going to do that. That might be a little better. Oh, nope, that's not doing anything for us. Not sure. <laughs> As I say, I can uh, you do new, new tab with Pro or something like that. Oh, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> that was way better. There we go. Is that right? No, that's still, still transparent. transparent. <laughs> uh, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't look transparent on my screen, but obviously it is here. Okay. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Okay. First thing we're going to do is open up the gym file. And we're going to add our uh, mutant uh, RSpec gem. And I guess I do need to point out it only supports RSpec at this time. They are working on a branch for mini tests, but right now it is only supported uh, with RSpec. Um, so bundle install, I should already have that. Um, and now we're going to uh, grab this command here that I canned earlier. So they don't have, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at their lib folder right here. They kind of just have loose files. I don't think it's the greatest gem uh, organization here, but they just have a couple of loose files, a number of loose files in the, in the direct lib folder. And then uh, they don't even have enough specs to match those of their files in there, but uh, we'll pick one and we'll go with it. Um, actually, let's take a look at that code before we run it. Um, so I'm going to pick a file here. Uh, can I blow this up at all? So I feel like this is your pretty much basic example. So I'm picking this API utils, which is just a module with, uh, with like four static methods in it. And hopefully RuboCap doesn't mess me up here. Um, four static methods. Uh, you can see that they are just doing some conversions, basically. Some string to symbol, symbols to string, uh, camelizing things. Uh, down casing, right? We're doing a number of things and, and, and really not many conditionals other than this last method has a, a ternary operator in it. So from a test perspective, you're going to get 
real real quick, right? Um, here is the here is the spec that matches that, right? So they uh, they're covering all four methods uh, with a variety of inputs, um, and and all of those are passing. So so one assumption, obviously, with mutant testing, maybe is that all your all your all your tests currently pass. Um, Otherwise, you'll get a lot of failures. So we're going to run mutant. Uh, we're going to tell it to include everything in the lib folder. That's kind of how it bootstraps itself a little bit. Um, the use rspec is kind of annoying because you have to do that every time. It only supports rspec. Um, and then you tell it the class that you want to run over. So as we run this, it's going to kind of get uh, a little verbose up in here. So it's running through generating mutants. You can kind of see the counter up there. Uh, I'm going to run it one more time just so you guys can maybe watch some of the numbers up here. So it's we have 131 mutants that it's running. It's tally, tallying up the kills, how many are still alive, and then your final coverage. So I'll go ahead and, uh, yeah, that's what we'll go look at. Oh, wait. Yeah, this is the fun part of the console output. Um, here we go. So this should have been the final console output. Um, it's running eight jobs, so it did it multi multi threaded, right? Trying to run as many of these uh, mutations as possible. So, so just in that one four method file with ten lines of code, we came up with 131 mutations, right? That that's that's quite a bit. Um, so we killed 108. 23 are still alive. Took about five seconds to run, and our yeah final final mutant score. Uh, mutations uh, coverage score is 80 percent. So uh, here we can see the kind of things that it's doing. So it's, it replaced this entire G sub line with a nil or with just the string that was passed in or with self or it changed the regex completely. Um, so you can see there that kind of points out we must not be using that regex for anything. Um, now we jump down into the second method here. I think there's, I think two methods are, are fine and two methods are not. So we can see here that this method, it changes the actual conditional. Um, checking for a symbol, it just says, yeah, let's just look at the class. Uh, this one, it changed an operator. So from double equals to the actual object equal. Uh, and then another, one, another time to the other object equal. Here it just threw in a constant. If I'm a symbol, what happens? Here I just threw in true. Um, and, and these are all things that we did not catch. So all of these errors, our, our current test did not catch. Um, this one's a neat one. Uh, an entire if else block, that ternary, was replaced with one line. Didn't get caught. Um, and then, yeah, the else, else statement was removed. All kinds of things, right? So it's pretty interesting to see the types of changes that can happen that don't actually get caught. Um, so let's take a look at this last one, this camelized to string. Sorry, the method name is symbol to string. Symbol to string is what we're looking at here. And I'm messing up my screens. Okay, so symbol to string here. Uh, we see that it's checking an input for symbol and it's calling camelize with space. This is scrolling. Um, so we're hitting symbol, it's converting a symbol to a string, or it's just passing that string right onto camelize with space. So the first thing we can see over here is that all of our inputs um, are symbols. So we're, we're not even testing the case uh, of a string input. Um, so let's, let's at least start with that. Um, if I just quote this guy, um, I should hopefully reasonably end up with the same same uh, output, right? It's taking this and, and converting converting to a string. Um, and it might be kind of a bad name, I guess, symbol to string, but you can pass in string. So uh, let's see how well just that change does itself. So we're at 82% with 23 alive. All right, so. Let's jump up here a little bit. So now we're we're at 87% with 16 alive. So we, we killed some, but but not all of them. Um, so let's see what is still a problem. So we look at uh, I think we only have oh we still have yeah we still have a number in this method. Um, can you guys see it all or uh, 
anything stand out to you at what might be? And I know, I guess you guys haven't really studied the code at all, but um, what about this guy right here? Does this does this one stand out to you guys at all, or or maybe just even the logic of this method? Right. Yeah. So in some in some ways, this tells you how to write better code. If you want to look at it that at that point, so it's saying, hey, I can remove this entire block and replace it with a one-liner, and it's functionally equivalent, right? So here are some of those. That's one example, I guess, of a uh, a mutant equivalent. So it does the exact same thing. Um, so it's not really a failure in this case, um, and and we can we can write better code. So. Let's jump over here, and, and so now we're changing the implementation. We're not just adding another spec to do uh, more coverage, we're actually changing the implementation. So, you know what, this did this to me the other day. My Adam, like, uh, lock, does something weird, I think, when uh, RuboCop doesn't uh, initialize properly. So I'm just gonna jump in here with them, and we're gonna <coughs> remove all this code, because we don't need it. And all those uh, mutations that were happening in there with the if if clause and changing out the Boolean operators, right? No more, really, no more mutants that can be done to that method, or 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 are there? So what happens here, right? Look at this guy here. So the final spec, the the final mutant that we need to kill. What's the difference between that self and not self? Really, nothing. It's another equivalent. So. So that's where in mutation testing, you either just start to ignore those, um, or in our case, we can get rid of it because self and non-self are the same. This isn't, that's not even reloading for me, is it? Okay, so I'm just gonna get rid of self because it's, uh, again, it's equivalent. Uh, it's a static method calling another static method, and we can, for the proof of example, get rid of it. Okay, so we are now up to 92% uh, coverage with still eight mutants alive, but we are done with that method. That method is now 100%. Um, so now we're on to our other method here called string to symbol. And you can see here that uh, pretty much everything that fails has to do with this one line, this one G sub line. Um, that here's the original right here, right? It's looking for um, some parentheses and it wants to replace that with nothing. Um, so what that means is we're, we're lacking a test coverage there. So we've written 100% code coverage of our method. Sorry, keep getting flipped around. Um, but we're not exercising that particular line of code. So to do that, uh, what did I say that was? String to symbol, I forgot what, uh, like my short shortcut keys are not working here. So string to symbol, we have uh, we have several methods here, um, or several function. Yeah, I guess several test cases here, uh, but none that include um, parentheses, right? I think it was. So if we say throw some parentheses in here and run this. Now modifications to that G subline are covered. They're captured because we're actually putting through a test case that exercises that line of code. So now we are at 100% coverage, and there are no more mutants. So that is that is the goal of mutation testing. Um, so uh, let's continue on with the slides here. So pros and cons to this. Uh, why you guys probably haven't heard of it or haven't used it in your job professionally. Um, I guess you could start with the cons, is that it's computationally expensive. So with that small test case, uh, four methods, came up with 131 mutants, took five seconds to run. Not that bad, but run that over thousands and thousands of lines of code, and uh, that's a very time-consuming process. Um, you also have the issue of equivalent mutants, which, uh, which, I was just, uh, which we saw a couple examples of. You either begin to ignore those or, or whatever. They become white noise, kind of. Uh, pros to it, though, as you can see, is uh, you know it's improved improved coverage. As you can see, we can make sure that the lines of code we are writing are actually being exercised and doing what we want them to do. Um, much higher improved error detection. So as you mutate that code, um, you are writing better and better tests to cover those changes. 
Um, and then now you have a higher confidence in your tests. Um, I know we have some tests at work that I'm not incredibly confident in because there's so many different pure mutations and we might just be covering the three or four you know, happy flow scenarios that are gonna always pass. So um, that's that. Uh, so what we did, uh, Clayton and myself and two other coworkers for Rails Rumble this year, we entered in a mutation station um, application. So we actually took this concept and turned it into a software as a service idea, um, like uh, like Code Climate. So we built out a uh, a fun little interface rail on Rails, deployed to Heroku. Um, and I'm going to just show you the one in here that uh, actually works. So I have a couple of specs here uh, and a repository. So you you add a repository, we'll scan it, look for your specs, look for your classes, and show you which ones are actually there. So we say, hey, you have three classes that actually have specs. Um, let's go ahead and run those. Um, so this is putting it back into a background worker. Uh, we're running it through that same exact mutant gem that we modified to support this workflow. Um, so again, like, a, like a, a continuous integration or a code climate, we're checking out your code, we're, we're bundle installing, getting all the dependencies, we're actually injecting mutant RSpec into your gem file and then running all of the specs for you. Um, so the idea here and where mutation testing could be viable is with a service like this where you just let it run and then come back to it later. So again, you get the same output that we've been looking at here, right? We took that same exact mutant gem output um, and, and give you the results. So here we're at a 96% coverage here. Uh, there's still four mutants that are alive and it happened here in this uh, conditional spec where it started changing some Boolean operators um, and we didn't have uh, the inputs or the tests to cover uh, these specs. So we show those to you and then we also show you, um, this is another one of the, those assignments, right? So it's taking a, a numeric, uh, just literal and changing it. Um, but then we show you the specs that did pass. So we say, hey, good job, you beat us uh, on these specs. Um, and then uh, we kind of just show you the raw log file of it here, which, uh, which is what we were basically running in the console. Um, so kind of a fun, again, kind of theoretical, fun project to, to see how well things are doing. Um, let's see here, I think that is all. So closing remarks, test your code. Uh, Tinderbox is hiring, <laughs> and uh, I made this with Remark.js, which I just found like three days ago. So it was, it was okay. It's all in Markdown. You don't need a web server or anything. Which is good. So that's it. Any questions? Yeah. So say you have 100% test coverage, and all your you have no mutants, at least according to this gem. Mm -hmm. I mean, <coughs> what could you still be missing? What does this not catch? I'm not sure. That hard question. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I know that this gym specifically and some of the libraries don't do all of those mutation operators. So it could be that they only support some or uh, yeah, a handful of those operators. So maybe you know you'd be missing some of those. Is there a defined um, number of ways you could mutate something, or it seems like it could be infinite? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, and that's yes. a, yeah, that is a problem. That yes, yeah, some some code could have an infinite. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe not infinite, but longer than you want to wait for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know the mutant gym has a specific timeout where it says if I'm if I've been mutating this code for longer than five minutes, like let's just move on. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's one of those cons I would say is it's computationally expensive and can run for a very long time. So yeah, I, I think I started running it over. It was, an, it was either our Rails app or another app, and you know I let it run for an hour or so, and it was just still going. And, so yeah, you probably have to start taking it one by one, you know, focusing in the files that are most important and yeah, see what you get out of it. Kind of leads into a follow-up question, yeah. which is how, how would you integrate this into your testing workflow? Is it the kind of thing you run on every build or you know, once a month, kind of just see where you stand? Yeah, uh, I think it would be great to integrate with uh, kind of change sets. So if I'm changing code, uh, like, I, like I was showing there in Mutation Station, um, where we show you the classes that actually have files. Um, I think I can jump into this one too. So these guys here, right, uh, maybe in a change set detect what classes changed and if they have specs and then only run it for those so that you're kind of incrementally improving your code as you're changing it. Um, because yeah, it'd probably be a very uh, long process to just run it against your entire test, your entire code base. 
So I would probably start with just some kind of incremental build. Is the percentage calculation, is that just the number of tests that you have and then the number of tests that are susceptible to mutation? So not the number of tests so you have, but it's, it's based on the number of mutants that were created. So how many like permutations of the code did it create? So if it changed a minus to a plus, that's a mutant. And if you covered it, then you would have 100%. But if you didn't cover it, right, you'd have one mutant that wasn't covered. So it's, it's purely based off of the number of mutants that were caught or not. I think, I think if I understood your question, right? Okay. I guess what I see is kind of code climate. You know, some people say, okay, fail it if it's a C or below on anything. Mm -hmm. So probably something comparable where it's okay. If anything has less than 75%, you can cover it. Oh, true, like yeah. You can do something similar. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Seems like and that might help you with those equivalent mutants too, because I feel like you might just have code that always has equivalent mutants, and you would, yeah, you'd want to ignore those. Is there a way to like rerun kind of only the failing ones again? You know, like, what's like, what's like, we're kind of like iterating on, okay, I know these 10 are failing, let's kind of work on these. Is there a way to do like a subset or something like I don't, that? I don't know if there is. Yeah. I'm not sure. I think some libraries probably have that. I can't remember if uh, the mutant gym does. I know, I think it's supposed to. Like, I think you can target in on a method. So here's a couple of its examples here where you can run an entire module, you can run a class. I think these are running specific methods. So I think you could focus in at, at that level, yeah. But but not, yeah, I would agree though, not, I don't know that you can pinpoint like a specific mutant. Um, and what I did notice is the all of the mutants that it creates that pass, you don't see. So, you, right, like we, we're just left here with, hey, you got 100%, but you don't get to see the 130 some, or I guess this is just 102 now because we changed some code. You don't see all of them that were created. I think my code was good, now I'm all nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it does, yeah, this makes you nervous. It's, uh, you should definitely try it out. It's, it's, it's a fun little exercise. Is that it? All right. Clayton, did I give you enough time? Oh, wow.